Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We are on our seventh and our final or last voyage of Sinbad the Sailor. On my return home from the sixth voyage, I had entirely given up thoughts of again going out to sea. For besides that my not age now required rest, I was resolved no more to expose myself to such risks as I had encountered, so that I thought of nothing but pass the rest of my days in tranquility. One day, however, an officer of the caliphate inquired of me. The caliphate, said he, has sent me to tell you that he must speak with you. I followed the officer to the palace, where being presented to the caliphate, I saluted him by prostrating myself at his feet. Remember, that means to lay down. Sinbad, said he to me, I stand in need of your service. You must carry my answer and present to the king of Serendib. The command of the th caliphate was to me like a clap of thunder. Commander of the faithful, I replied, I am re ready to do whatever your majesty shall think fit to command, but I beseech you most humbly to consider what I have undergone. I have also made a vow never to leave Baghdad. Perceiving that the caliphate assisted upon my compliance, I submitted, and I told him that I was willing to obey. He was very well pleased and ordered me 1,000 sequins at the expense for the expenses of my journey. I prepared for my departure in a few days, and as soon as the caliphate's letter and present were delivered to me, I went to Bashori, where I embarked, and had a very prosperous voyage. Having arrived on the Isle of Serendib, I, conduct, I was conducted to the palace, which much pomp, when I prostrated myself on the ground before the king. Sinbad, said the king, you are welcome. I have many times thought of you. I bless the day on which I see you once more. I made my compliments to him and thanked him for his kindness and delivered the gifts from my August master. The caliphate's letter was as followed. Greeting, in the name of the sovereign guide of the right way from the servant of God, Haran al-Rashid, whom God has set in place in the place of the vice regent to his prophet, after his ancestors of happy memory to the potent and esteemed Raja of Serendib. Received your letter with joy and send you this from my imperial residence, the garden of superior wits. We hope when you look upon it, you will perceive our good intention and be pleased with it. Farewell. The caliphate's present was a complete suit cloth of gold valued at 1,000 sequins, 50 robes of rich stuff, a hundred of white cloth, the finest of Cairo, Suez, and Alexandria, a vessel of agate more broad than deep, an inch thick and a half a foot wide, the bottom of which represented in bas relief a man with one knee on the ground who held a bow and arrow ready to discharge at a lion. He sent him also a rich tablet, which according to tradition belonged to the great Solomon. The king of Serendib was highly gratified at the caliphate's acknowledgement of his friendship. A little time after this audience, I solicited Lee to the part and with much difficulty obtained it. The king, when he dismissed me, made me a very considerable present. I embarked immediately to return to Baghdad, but had not the good fortune to arrive there so speedily as I had hoped. God ordered it otherwise. Three or four days after my departure, we were attacked by pirates who easily seized upon our ship because it was not a vessel of war. Some of the crew offered resistance, which cost them their lives. But for myself and the rest, we were not so impudent. The pirates saved us and carried us to a remote island where they sold us. I fell into the hands of a rich merchant who, as soon as he bought me, took me to his house. He treated me well and clad me handsomely as a slave. Some days after, he asked me if I understood my tra any trade. I answered that I was no mechanic, but a merchant, and that the pirates who sold me had robbed me of all I possessed. Tell me, replied me, can you shoot a bow? I answered that the bow was one of my exercises of my youth. He gave me a bow and arrows and taking me behind him on the elephant, carried me into a thick forest some leagues from the town. We penetrated a great way into the wood, and when he thought fit to stop, he bade me alight. Then he showed me a great tree. Climb up that, said he, and shoot at the elephants as you see them pass, for there is a prestigious number of them in this forest. And if any of them fall, come and give me notice. Having spoken thus, he left me victuals, that means food, and returned to town. And I continued upon the tree all night. I saw no elephant during the night, but the next morning at the break of day, I perceived a great number. 
I shot several arrows among them, and at last one of the elephants fell. And when the rest retired immediately, they left me at liberty to go and acquaint the patron with my success. When I had informed him, he commanded, commended my dexterity and caressed me highly. We went afterwards together to the forest where we dug a hole for the elephant, my patron designing to return when it was rotten and take the tree to, to trade with. I continued this employment for two months. One morning, as I looked for the elephants, I perceived with extreme amazement that instead of passing by me across the forest as usual, they stopped and came to me with a horrible noise and in such numbers that the plain was covered and shook under them. They surrounded the tree in which I was sealed with their trunks uplifted and they all fixed their eyes upon me. At this alarming spectacle, I continued immobile and was so much terrified that my bow and arrows fell out of my hand. My fears were not without cause, for after the elephants had stared upon me for some time, one of the largest of them put his trunk around the foot of the tree, plucked it up, and threw it on the ground. I fell with the tree, and the elephant, taking me up in his trunk, laid me on his back, where I sat more like one dead than alive. With my quiver on my shoulder, he put me at the head of the rest and followed him in line, one after the other. He put himself at the head of the rest, who followed him in line one after the other. He carried me a considerable way, then laid me down on the ground and retired with all of his companions. After having lain some time and seeing the elephants gone, I got up and found that I was on a long and broad hill, almost covered with the bones and the teeth of elephants. I doubted not but this was the burial place of the elephants and that they carried me thither on purpose to tell me that I should forbear to kill them as now I knew where to get their teeth without inflicting injury on them. I did not stay on the hill, but I turned toward the city, and after having traded a day and a night, I came to my patron. As soon as my patron saw me, Ah, poor Sinbad, exclaimed he. I was in great trouble to know what had become of you. I have been to the forest where I found the tree newly pulled up and your bow and arrows on the ground, and I despaired of ever seeing you more. Pray tell me what befell you. I satisfied his curiosity, and the both of us set out the next morning to the hill. We loaded the elephant, which had carried us with as many teeth as he could bear, and when we returned, my master thus, my master thus addressed me. Hear now what I shall tell you. The elephants of our forest have every year killed us a great many slaves, whom we sent to seek the ivory. For all of the cautions we could give them, these crafty animals destroyed them one time or another. God has delivered you from their fury and has bestowed that favor upon you and you only. It is a sign that he loves you and has some use for your service in the world. You have procured me incredible wealth, and now our whole city is enriched by your means without any more exposing the lives of our slaves. After such a discovery, I can treat you no more as a slave, but as a brother. God bless you with all the richness and with all the happiness and prosperity. I henceforth give you your liberty, and I also give you riches. To this I replied, Master, God preserve us. I desire no other reward for my service. I had the good fortune to do to you and your city, but to leave and return to my own country. Very well, said he. The monsoon will be a little time bring ships for ivory, and I will then send you home. I stayed with him while waiting for the monsoon, and during the time we made so many journeys to the hill that we filled our warehouses with ivory. The other merchants who traded in it did the same, for my master made them partakers of his good fortune. The ships arrived at last, and my master himself, having made a choice of a ship wherein I was to embark, loaded half of it with ivory on my account laid in provisions of abundance for my passage, and besides obliged me to accept a present of some curiosities of the country of the great value. After I re had returned him a thousand thanks for all of his favors, I went abroad. We stopped at some islands to take in fresh provisions. Our vessel being come to a port on the mainland of the Indies, we touched there, and not being willing to venture by sea to Besor, I landed my portion of the ivory, resolving to proceed on my journey by land. I realized vast sums by my ivory, bought several rarities, which I intended for presents. And when my equipage was ready, I set out in the company with a large caravan of merchants. I was a long time on the journey and I suffered much, but I was happy in thinking that I had nothing to fear from the seas, from the pirates, 
from serpents or from the other perils to which I had been so much exposed. I at last arrived safe at Baghdad and immediately waited upon the caliphate to give him an account of my embassy. He loaded me with honors and rich presents, and I have ever since devoted myself to my family, to my kindred, and to my friends. Sinbad here finished the relation of his seventh and his last voyage, and thus addressing himself to Hinbad. Well, friend, said he, did you ever hear of any person that suffered as much as I have done? Is it not reasonable that after this I should enjoy a quiet and a pleasant life? <coughs> Excuse me. As he said these words, Hinbad kissed his hand and said, Sir, my afflictions are not to be compared with yours. You not only deserve a quiet life, but are worthy of all of the riches that you possess, since you make such a good use of them. May you live happily for a long time. Sinbad ordered him to be paid another hundred sequins and told him to give up carrying burdens as a porter and to eat henceforth at his table. For he wished that he should all of his life have reason to remember that he henceforth had a friend in Sinbad, the sailor. Okay, we have one last interactive notebook entry for Sinbad, the sailor. I want you in your interactive notebook to write a short paragraph and tell me your favorite part of any of the seven journeys of Sinbad the Sailor. Write a paragraph, at least one paragraph, telling me of your favorite part of Sinbad the Sailor that we have just read. Have a great day and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.